set up correctly because I am the queen of tech ding battery. Okay, I think I've got it. I think we're good. Okay, I'm sitting down and I am here for another episode of Conscious Coffee. It's just another conscious coffee. Oh, oh. Mm. I love me some coffee. These are segments that I'm going to try and do with consistency. Don't hold me to it. But in which I'm just going to talk. And we're going to flow. And we're going to see what spirit wants to talk about and what this day holds. So thank you for being with me. I don't know how long we're going to go. I'm just going to, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that you asked. Some of you are asking questions here on YouTube. Some of you are asking questions here in the Lightworkers Lab. And so I just try to assemble questions where I can and answer them. And if the question requires a bit more than just a paragraph of, of an answer, I want to make a video for it because I think it just helps other people besides the person asking the question. I want to start by acknowledging that a lot of you are actually asking for the story of my crazy ex-boyfriend. What's going here? Well, I don't, if there's a shadow, whatever. It doesn't matter. Crazy tech, ding bad a tree. But you guys asked about my crazy ex-boyfriend. I was talking in a video that I put up just yesterday about twin flames and whether I actually believed in the idea of twin flames. And I said in that video, and I will reiterate, that I, I don't believe in this sort of new age mythology of twin flames, but I have changed my mind because previously I absolutely did believe in twin flames. In fact, somebody asked me if I had any videos on twin flames, and I think I do, somewhere out in these YouTube streets. We've got some video of me talking about twin flames, totally buying into it. and loving the idea of it, but I think, you know, we do what we do with what we know at the time, and I think I've come into the realization that Twin Flames and the ideology of Twin Flames, that's just another new age buzzword construct. I don't think that uh, this idea that we have a split apart, we have another soul out there who is exactly like us, has the same soul that we must wander the planet looking for so that we can have a perfect relationship with them or a perfect love, romantic relationship with them. I think that idea just sets us up for suffering. Like it allows people to dismiss and discount really quality potential partners or friends because they're looking for something else. I said in that video, I'll say again, that the root of all suffering is expectation. That's a Buddhic saying. That's not a Crystal Ann Compton saying. The root of all suffering is expectation because when we're expecting that life should be a certain way or that we should be at a certain place in life by a certain time, but then it's not that way, we get depressed. We feel rejected. We feel unhappy and we feel, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong and so that sets us up for low vibration living and it's the same thing with people when we expect our partner to be a certain way to look a certain way to talk a certain way or provide for us in a certain way we are setting ourselves up to suffer because they are their own self-determining soul complex they got their own gig going on and truly it is the flaws in all of us that make us beautiful it is the flaws in all of us that connect us to one another. See, when I see your pain and I recognize your pain because I've had that pain and it's changed me in a certain way, I see you more clearly. I relate to you more intimately. Your flaws, your past, your experience make you who it is that you are. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I don't think we, we ever intended to be perfect when we came into these incarnations. So I think we need to set aside this idea that there really is any perfect partner and that there is another soul that resembles our own perfectly. I just don't think so anymore. And I think it's okay to change your mind. Please hold. As you grow, of course you're going to. As a child, we thought of childish things. We like to play with Tonka toys. 
or I don't know what, it, what it, I like to play with my Barbies and I like to play with it. I like to imagine in a certain way. I like to adventure in a certain way. Now, so many years later, I don't think the same things. I don't believe the same things. Those things don't interest me anymore. Or I've learned enough to now equip myself in a different way. So five, 10 years ago, I would have said, totally, we have twin flames. Here where I sit right now, I'm like, eh, I don't think so. I think this is what we have. This is what it is. So that was the video from yesterday. I talked a bit more about it. Um, but in that video, I mentioned having a crazy relationship with an ex-boyfriend. And I didn't get into it at the time because it was just a whole lot of, too much, it was too much. But I asked you guys whether you wanted to hear the story of that relationship. And quite a few of you said that you did. And in Facebook and on YouTube, you said that you did. So I'm gonna share the story with you. But let me preface by saying that the person, this ex-boyfriend that I had, is not a bad person. Not um, a terrible, negative, awful human being. No. He and I just created a combination together that didn't work. We had a lot going for us. In, for the most part, it was on that physical level. Um, but, And we, we did have a lot of psychology in common as well, but he just, we were a match, <laughs> but for a season of life only. I am certain that we both came into this life with plans to hang out together, teach each other through the chaos and through the pain of that relationship. And boy, did we ever. And so I regard this person, even though I don't have any contact with him, nor would I, I regard this person as a soulmate of mine, actually, and as somebody that I was karmically, or in my blueprint, I was supposed to encounter at some point because that relationship taught me a lot, and for that, I'm truly grateful. And for anybody out there who might know who I am personally, don't make any assumptions about who this person is. You know what they say about assumptions. You make an ass out of you, not me. <laughs> but this is just, let's just treat this like a hypothetical hypothetical so don't we don't need to wonder who it is in crystal's past but uh, let me tell you the story because the, what makes the story of this ex-boyfriend and this relationship so interesting is the fact that it was just riddled with psychic evidences and see this is something i do believe when we meet somebody who is fated f-a-t-e-d somebody who is in our blueprint, somebody with whom we share a soul group. A soul group is just a group of souls with whom we incarnate life after life after life. We just switch roles up in the various lives, but we essentially stick together and we teach each, teach each other stuff throughout all of these lives. But when we encounter somebody who is extremely important on a soul level, it's not uncommon that that relationship is accompanied by all kinds of signs and wonders. Things like knowing what they're gonna say right before they say it, knowing they're gonna text or that they're gonna call right before they do and then they do. Things like out-of-body experiences, shared dreams, shared astral travel, things like reading of the mind, knowing what they're thinking and then talking to them in your mind. Like it can get a little crazy. Things like actual apparitions, things, energetic patterns that manifest within the lives, within the space as a result of that relationship. And let's start there because this relationship was so crazy and so chaotically energetic that there were actual thought forms connected to that relationship. And to be fair, those thought forms weren't generated on my end. Those thought forms were generated on his end. And let me start by saying that Everyone with whom we have a meaningful relationship, a love relationship, a, a partnership, anybody in our life with whom we have that meaningful relationship, we also have with them something called Aka cords. These are energetic cords that connect us with those people. And those cords run a lot of different things. Those cords facilitate the transference of energy, of information, of emotion, those cords transfer and return all kinds of knowledge, truth, chaos, 
pain. I mean, those chords facilitate the interaction of the two people. And so this person and I most definitely had Akka chords. In fact, we had so many Akka chords and I was always like up in here chopping them, hiya, trying to sever those chords because they would always reattach. And that's another thing that happens with chords. They will reattach. If you allow yourself to get back into the mind frame of the relationship with this person, or if they're over there fixated on you and why you aren't calling them, well, they are reattaching their chords to you and vice versa. So this relationship, just in general, was extremely toxic and it was extremely chaotic and it was super intense and super passionate like they always are but always up and down so we were constantly breaking up and making up and breaking up and making up and it was exhausting but when we would break up there would be such an emotional outpouring from both sides but on his side in particular and when he was mad when he got mad at me which was frequently I'm sure I'm a brat, but when he got mad at me, he would send things through the cords. And one of the things that he would send was a being. When I, I, I grew to understand that when I saw this being or when, when others saw this being, and it wasn't just me, that meant that this boyfriend was thinking intensely about me and probably in a negative way. The first time I encountered this being, I was in bed at night. I was typing away at my laptop and I noticed in the doorway of my bedroom some movement. I looked up and they're standing in the doorway like this. I'm seeing this with my naked vision, like I'm seeing it with my eyes. Was a, be a being, male, probably about six and a half feet. I don't know how tall doors tend to be, but like filling pretty much the whole door. He had a leather jacket on which is how I came to realize, oh, that's something he's projecting at me because he was always in a leather jacket, my ex-boyfriend. Uh, jeans, riding boots, and this face that was literally like a balloon, all stark white, round, just purely round, with black eyes that were just black holes, and this weird, freaked out mouth, kind of like, what's that video, Black Hole Sun? by Soundgarden, I don't know, this weird distended Cheshire cat kind of smile and this sense of he was project, this entity was projecting out, not malevolence, because I don't believe the ex-boyfriend ever felt malevolent toward me, but just this negativity, let's put it that way, projecting out this negativity. And of course, upon seeing this apparition and being a human, not unlike yourself, I, I freaked the F out. I was like, what the F is that? And went right into all my protection rituals and my stance, my dominion, and like, this is my space, get on out of here, and it did. That was the first time it ever happened. It ended up happening quite a few times after that, and as I said, it wasn't just happening to me. This actually began to show up with other dudes <laughs> that were dating me. This apparition would show up in the space where I was with these people, uh, and once when I wasn't even there. But the second time that apparition showed up, my daughter actually saw it. She said, Mom, because my, my daughter wasn't, is mediumistic, so spirits have always been part of like our thing. And she said, Mom, there was a man walking the hallway, the bedroom hallway, back and forth. And I said, okay, well, what did the man look like? And she described the leather jacket, the jeans, the boots, and this weird freaking head with this strange smile. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I explained to her what that was and why that was. And I told her how to make sure that it went away. The next time this apparition appeared, I was actually on a date. Now I was on a date with somebody that the ex-boyfriend knew about a little bit, like it was in his awareness, like there's a potential Crystal might go on a date with this guy, and so therefore he hated him. <laughs> and I was on a date with this guy. This guy happened to be a cop, really choice, wonderful, awesome guy. Well, he wasn't a cop at the time, but he was a fed. I don't remember. Anyway, we were on a date, and we were. he was driving me home, and at some point he turned around to say something. I was in the passenger seat, and he went like that. And, I'm, and I said, what? And he had seen right next to my head, sitting in the car, that big balloon head with the weird freaking smile and he 
was very shook by that because he wasn't a person who had a lot of evidences. I just began telling people, honestly, like if we're going to hang out, like don't be surprised if all of a sudden there's going to be a weird spirit in your house or you'll hear a voice or something because where I would go and I was plugged into such a degree, like I would just, vortices would happen, portals, things would start going on, lights are flashing in people's houses. I'm like, don't invite me to dinner unless you're okay with that. So this happened a couple of different times. There were weird evidences with this one, one man, but that was another time that this odd thought form entity showed up and, and he saw it. And it happened again a couple of times, but no, most notably the last time it happened was when I was with my husband, Jeremy. So it's no longer dating cop guy. Time had passed and stuff. But that didn't mean that the ex-boyfriend, wherever he was, wasn't still thinking about some Crystal Ann Compton, you know what I'm saying? Still thinking about me. Still running it through the brain and all that crazy energy that we had in our relationship. So he, he was thinking about me and possibly in a negative way and the entity showed up in the new house where it was Jeremy's house. We ended up moving into Jeremy's house and I was away that weekend so I wasn't even there. I had gone to Jesus camp with my friend Vibica. It's a spiritual spiritualist camp in Kansas. So I was gone for a few days and my husband being such a manly man, okay, so sexy, so sexy, was like tearing down the cabinets and like putting up new cabinets and plumbing the sink and like creating this whole new kitchen for me. So by the time I came home, it was just going to be gorgeous. Oh, he's so handy. Anyway, sidetracked. So he's in the process of like dismantling this kitchen and he's got all his tools out and it's late at night. And at some point he turns around and there's a staircase kind of right by the kitchen from the second floor to the first. And at the top of the stair faced, there's balloon head just looking at him weird smile checking out my husband and my husband looked at it looked away <laughs> and you have to know my husband he's uh, he's agnostic he's not into all the stuff that I'm in looked at it looked away looked back it was still there and then he just turned his back and he kept on working he's too busy he had a lot to do my husband has always been that way since knowing me we've had all kinds of evidences that have happened around me and around this hizzy and he's just like I don't care dude I'm tired I don't I see that there's a spirit whistling at me. I don't have time for that though. So he didn't really care, but he did tell me about it. So that was the chaotic nature of the crazy relationship I had with this ex-boyfriend. There were all kinds of psychic evidences. It wasn't just the weird thought form that he sent to me. There were other things too, like he was really psychic. And here's the thing, people. You don't have to be spiritually connected to your I am consciousness. All Womping, womp, womp, connected to source and in the light and in the love, which I try to be. You probably try to be too. We try to be the light. You don't have to be like that to be psychic. In fact, there are a lot of very psychic people who are not spiritual. There are a lot of very psychic people who aren't good, who don't have their heart light turned on. ET phone home. They're just walking around the planet using these abilities, which they understand and know how to work with for their own good or for for what it is that they want and so this ex-boyfriend was like that he wasn't particularly spiritual he wasn't into it like I was into it he knew I was very very intuitive and I wanted to develop that I wanted to you know have clients like he knew what I was into but didn't care at all and had his own life and his own stuff and something had happened in his life that ended up changing him and I won't go into why because it's sensitive, but, and so he really was an unanchored individual, very ungrounded and often would like switch lanes in his consciousness. I could see it in his eyes. He would switch lanes like one minute. He'd be talking to me just about whatever's and the next minute switch lanes and he's accessing, he's hooked into some weird astral dimension and all of a sudden he's channeling. And of course I'm fascinated by it because I'm fascinated by metaphysics. It took me a little while though to figure out what he was actually doing. Like it took me a little while to understand the prompt or his tell, if you will, in his eyes and in his face when he switched from this reality to another reality and all of a sudden was talking about dimensionality and densities and the beings that lived in higher dimensions and he was telling me that he was actually talking to his other self in a dimension three 
three dimensions removed from our own in the form and he was in the form of a lion I mean, and I would get a pen and a paper I'd be like writing it all down like go on lion lion man tell me more fascinated but uncontrolled like it would happen as we're like watching law and order dun 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 and he's going off on his weird channeling tangent so one night we were asleep and I was awoken to talking. It was middle of the night, two in the morning, three in the morning. Awoken to just talking. And I turned on my light. I looked over and he was sitting up in bed, like freaked out. Okay, I got freaked out. Sitting up in bed, just channeling, channeling, talking about it, asleep, but awake. Eyes awake. He's asleep, but channeling all this information relative to me, me, about me, about him too, and about the way things work, but about me. Of course, I grabbed a paper and a pen. I'm like, don't stop. This is so interesting, but that was weird. Sometimes he'd wake up. No, he wouldn't wake up. Sometimes as he slept, he would get out of bed, still asleep, and strike a pose. But an asana, a yogic pose. So he'd be doing like, you know, saluting the sun or doing tree pose or doing some sort of yogic pose asleep contorting his body and all these kundalini type facilitating asanas it was trippy and he didn't know it he'd wake up like in tree pose and he's like what the fuck is going on he wasn't a yogi <laughs> so he was highly connected to the world of spirit highly connected in terms of intuition and psychic but completely ungrounded and i want to take it are you with me are we listening are you, are you here for this because i'm going to take you even farther into this because it wasn't just switching lanes it was mind control there are some people on the planet who can control the will of another person simply by using their will internally and the will of the mind for example alistair crowley okay the beast was no of course notorious for imposing his will his intention his concentration his consciousness on another person and making them do his will through magic and there's a story about Alistair Crowley where he's walking on a sidewalk about six feet behind somebody and he wills in his consciousness for that person walking in front of him to trip and to fall and surely within a few seconds the person trips and the person falls and Alistair just keeps walking and chuckling but he had the power through his mind to control not just himself and what was happening with his own receivers, but also his space and also other people. Well, this ex-boyfriend of mine, coffee break, also had this facility. And he told me about it once. And of course I was like, sure babe, <laughs> you have the power of the mind. You can make me do what you want. Ooh, of course I made, of course I was a brat about it because that had never been demonstrated to me and he wasn't necessarily spiritual and he was kind of a big talker anyway and i was just like sure babe he told me about it once and he described it as such he says it's like a window of opportunity presents itself and i find myself in a vibration where i know okay i have a few minutes here a few seconds to make somebody do something or to change this space to change what's happening and it's a finite amount of time is what he said so it only lasted a couple of minutes and then that window closed and he could no longer have the ability to impose his will on anyone one day we were out at a dive bar and he said that the window appeared and he noticed it and he decided to make somebody across the room get up from the table and walk out of the bar and I didn't notice because I'm not paying attention and he didn't prepare me for it I'm just hanging out at the dive bar and he's he laughed and, and I said what and he said oh I just made that guy get out of the bar and I'm like what do you mean he's like well it happened I, I, I was able to control that person and their thinking and their their body and their mind and I made him leave and of course I was just like okay great Carmack of course you did <laughs> I was being a brat because he didn't tell me ahead of time he didn't I just thought he was maybe having a little bit too much whiskey or something until the one time he did it to me. We were outside on my patio. It was a beautiful night, just talking, chit-chatting. 
And I was talking about something going on, such as I do. And I noticed him kind of grab a piece of paper and a pen, which we, which we had out on the table. And he was writing something. And I'm sure I was thinking, oh, of course he's writing it down. Everything I say is a pearl of wisdom. He's writing it down. <laughs> I kept talking, chit-chatting. And I started, like, rubbing my nose, itching my nose a lot. I'm just getting, like, this really overpowering itch on my face and I was rubbing and I was but I was also talking I thought it was purely normal like this is it's just an itch you don't really notice it you just scratch an itch but it happened I was doing it for quite some time and he chuckled and I'm like well stop talking and I said well what are you laughing at and he slid the piece of paper over to me and he said oh no no and I opened it and it said your nose is itchy rub it Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so Brat Crystal kind of fell away into the background. And Present Crystal like looked at him like, dude, oh, you're telling the truth. You have the ability to impose your will on people. That was all the proof that I needed. And in that moment, I remembered one final thing that he had told me about something that happened in his life. And, and I'll share it with you, keeping in mind that this person is awesome if this is just an example of the psychic nature of this person and and the reason that that psychic nature and chaotic nature coupled with me and my spiritual exploration created a catastrophe of emotion and toxicity and so it made for a terrible combination anyway so when i saw that he actually had the ability to make me do something against my will i recalled a story that he told me something that happened when he was a teenager. When he was a teenager, he was dating this girl and she babysat for a family. And one night she was babysitting for the family and she said, hey, come over, like let's hang out. Even though that was against the rules and he wasn't supposed to be anywhere near them, of course he went and they started hanging out. It was innocent enough, but the family in question came home early, so they freaked out. The girl, the babysitter said, oh my God, come. And so they ran into the basement and there was like this walk-in closet in the basement with like two rows of clothes along the wall. And then like a back wall at the, at the very back of the walk-in closet that had, was just a wall. There were no clothes there. I think no clothes. And she said, hide in here, hide in here. So she shoved him in this closet, shut the door, ran upstairs just in time for the family to walk in. And he could hear everything that was going on from this lower level. Like he could hear them walking around. He could hear the conversation. He realized, oh my God, she's leaving. They're taking her, the father's taking her home. Could hear the car outside. And he realized, holy hell, I'm stuck in the closet in, this, in these people's houses. And then he hears footsteps above, walking around the kitchen. He knows the mother's there with the child. And the mother's looking around. He can hear her kind of go all around the house with her footsteps. And then he hears the door to the basement opening up. The mother starts walking down the steps into the basement. So the mother must have had some kind of intuition and knew something was not right. So she starts looking around the basement and he can hear not as well, but at some point she's drawing close to the closet. And this is the part of the story that is so incredible and which I now believe. At this point, realizing she's going to open that door and she's going to see him splayed against the back wall, not covered in clothes or anything like open out to be seen. He starts intending to be invisible. He says to himself with all his might internally, he's not talking out loud, he'll get found out. Internally, he's saying to himself, I'm invisible, she cannot see me, she will not see me, I am invisible, nobody can see me, nobody can see me, I am invisible, she cannot see me. Like, with all his might and all his power and all his focus and all his concentration and all his energy, he said this over and over and over, all of his will, I can just see the energy undulating off of him, his intention, I am invisible. The mother opens the door to the closet and he can see her because he's standing at the back of the closet turns on the light looks down this row of clothes looks across the back wall where he's standing right there continues to look down this row of clothes 
does it one more time, passing him again, and then shuts the door. She did not see him. He was invisible. He could hear her walking around again, because I think, again, her intuition is saying something's wrong here. And he realizes, as the teenage boy, well, like, well, how am I going to get out of this? I have to tell somebody I'm stuck in this closet. And so at some point, he calls out and says, excuse me, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm here. And she freaks out and gets all upset. And he's discovered, but she's shook to the foundation. She's shook because he was in the closet and she looked and he, she didn't see him. When he imposed his will upon me to rub my nose over and over like all itchy, I finally believed him that he had that kind of power. And I often think in retrospect, like, wow, what would his life be like if he knew how to harness that, like for good and not for, you know, random acts of manipulation? Like what if he could use those gifts and those talents and those abilities in a, in a way that would serve the light and that would be of love? But, you know, I don't know where he's at right now. I haven't talked to him in many, 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 many years, and that's just as it should be. But I can tell you for sure that that relationship was absolutely a soulmate connection. Was it a twin flame connection? Well, no, aren't you listening? I don't believe in those. But is that person an intimate member of my soul group? Absolutely, totally. Like we drew up the blueprint before we ever got here. We made all the plans and we decided we were going to share a life together. And that's exactly what we did. And of course, free will is the final determining factor. He didn't get his act together. I didn't get my act together. We didn't stay together. That's cool. Maybe in another life that changes. I hope not because I'm totally in love with Jeremy Compton and he's the only one I want in this life and in all other lives. Word. But... That relationship was so accompanied and adorned with fantastical psychic stuff, thought form entities, balloon head. He would read my mind. I would know when he was going to talk. There were apparitions. There were sparks of light. There was always something happening because there was that connection. It's almost like when those two, when two soul group soulmate energies come into contact, there's like a friction that happens and sparks fly. And those sparks appear in the physical materiality as psychic experiences and evidences. So that's my story of that relationship. And I want to emphasize that in life, irrespective of whether we spend time in toxic relationships or super healthy relationships, nothing is lost ever. Nothing is wasted ever. And even though we were quite toxic together, and even though he was really deceiving to me about a lot of stuff in his life, and that's a whole nother Oprah, I'm not going into it, even though like that wasn't destined to work, nothing in that relationship was wasted because I learned so much, not just about the power of the mind, which I now teach about quite a bit, but about myself, because I've often asked myself, I bet you have too, let me know in the comments if you have. I've asked myself, why, Crystal? Did you stay in that relationship for, what was it? Holy crap, it was almost three years. It was, a long, it was a, too long. I should have been in that relationship for three seconds, but I ended up elongating the relationship because I just couldn't get out of my own way. And I think as spiritual people, we have to realize that that's kind of the risk we take when we incarnate. We know we're going to incarnate into flesh bodies and that this flesh body comes with its own infrastructure of desires, of uh, legislating modalities, meaning the ego. The ego is here, by the way. There's nothing wrong with having an ego. I hear a lot of people saying, well, that's just your ego talking, you know. Your ego is good. Your ego is a filter that you need in order to navigate your third dimensional reality as a human being. Am I knocking this around? I'm going to move off. I do that all the time. But you need the ego. You need the flesh, which is the light body, in order to have this human incarnation. But there are inherent risks with the ego. There's inherent risks with the flesh. The flesh wants what it wants. And the flesh and the ego can trip us up in our lifetime and cause us to deviate from the path, the path that we drew up for ourselves in the blueprint that we created with our friends in soul groups, with our emissaries, before we ever 
incarnated. So spiritual people are vulnerable to getting caught up in the flesh. This is why in the Bible, I think it calls it the old man and the flesh dying to the flesh and creating the new mind, being renewed, right, in the mind and dying to the flesh, dying to the old man. That's kind of what it is, like denying the needs, the urges, the impulses of the flesh, which tend to be of a lower vibration, and instead pivoting and focusing on the energy of source, of, source, of God, of creator, and endeavoring and experiencing and building and creating in that energy, not in the flesh energy. That's the work of the life. That's the inherent risk of the life. And so just because I was spiritual at the time, and just because I was intuitive and, and I was actually helping people at the time, doesn't mean I wasn't susceptible to getting tripped all the way up in my life. Which leads me, my friends, to the first question that I wanted to answer today. Again, I get your questions on Facebook. I get your questions here in the comments on YouTube. I appreciate them. They help me to create content. You know a sister loves to talk. Okay. Thank you. Giving me an opportunity to talk and to be with you. I love you. Heart light. ET phone home. This question comes from the wonderful, the illustrious Mike Robert. He is a member of the Lightworkers Lab and every once in a while he pops up in the Light Room, which is one of our subgroups and he gives readings. He's really cool. Anyway, he said I could use his name. And this is his question. He says, I'm aware that our higher selves can make soul journey plans with other souls in which one of those souls may be abusive to the other. With that being said, where does free will come into play? Do some people just make bad earthly decisions outside their soul plans? Or does the free will come into play before we visit the earth? as we're drawing up the plans, I think he means. If we do make bad choices during our lives, outside of our soul plans or our blueprint, does the soul need extra time relative to their existence to reflect, to learn, and to heal before moving forward? Yes, you may use my name. Thank you, Micro Bear. That's a great question. What he's saying is, we have free will. Where does that show up? Does it show up in the creation of the blueprints as we're sitting there with our soul group? and our emissaries and making all our plans, charting our courses, is that where we are exhibiting free will? Or is it within the life? As we are living the life, we've got the blueprint, but we have free will and we have the power to deviate from the blueprint. Is everything predestined, in other words, contained in the blueprint, exactly what's supposed to happen? Or is the blueprint our hope, our goal for our lives? But once we get here, is there free will that allows us to change the path? The answer is free will exists in both of those aspects. We have free will as a soul before we incarnate and we do draw up plans and we do lean on our council, our team members, our soul groups, those people who are beloved to our soul, our emissaries, angels, guides, ancestors. They are all collaborating with us, co-creating, if you will, this incarnation that we ultimately dispatch ourselves into. So free will is there and collaboration is there as we create that blueprint. And then we incarnate knowing the inherent risk. The risk is, again, the flesh, which is of a lower signature than the spirit, especially big S spirit, source energy, our soul complex, the I am of who we are, super high vibration. Here in this 3D reality, though, we need a flesh suit. We need a light body in order to navigate the incarnation. And this light body vibrates at a lower frequency. It just does. And so the inherent risk is we occupy a light body which is vibrating at a lower rate as compared to who it is that we really are, causing us therefore frequently to click out of alignment. And also we understand that we develop amnesia upon incarnating. I say we develop it because let me be clear, babies have full remembrance. Babies that's why you see babies talking and giggling to nobody. That's why my daughter, when she was two and three, was talking to my deceased father and having full-on conversations because babies, they have the remembrance. Their pineal gland 
is fully functioning and fully formed. That's why we have young kids before the age of six typically who can remember in fullness their past lives because they have the recollection, they have the remembrance, and they also kind of know on a cosmological level why things are happening. Around six though, six or seven, that's when the pineal gland starts to shift and the amnesia sets in. And soon we are operating almost fully under the illusion that we are separate from everything. This is my toy. That's my car. This is my house. This is my country. This is my president. This is my body, and so on and so forth. We start operating under the illusion of being separate from other things. We develop amnesia, and here is where we can veer away from the blueprint. All those plans that we made before we incarnated, all those destinations, all those relationships, all the learning, all, all of it. We had it planned and built in, but this is the amnesia and the flesh can cause us to detour. Now, with regard to abusive relationships in particular, and with regard to seasons of pain and suffering that we as a soul built into this experience, usually... No, uh, mm -mm. always those seasons of trauma, seasons of ability have a beginning, it's not ability, seasons of trauma, seasons of abuse have a beginning and an end. I, I, I'm not God, I can't really say. So let me, usually <laughs> they have a beginning and an end. I really don't know of many souls who have, dispatch themselves into lives of just pure suffering the entire time. That, I don't understand that, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. So who am I to say that that can't happen? Most cases though, where you've got people who are stuck in abusive relationships, who, where you have people who are just running the loop, the narrative, the track of trauma, staying with the abuser or keeping themselves in situations, what they're actually doing is taking something built into the blueprint, something we could call karmic, and elongating it, drawing it out because they've habituated in some way to it. They've habituated themselves to the abuse, you see. They've habituated themselves to the trauma. They're used to it. And so when they are outside of the energy of that which they are used to, they seek to substitute and create an energy similar to what they just left or they, they go back to it. That is free will. That is the flesh. That is the ego mind. That is the reality of the third dimension, which is magnetic. It's sticky, I like to say, right? It's a sticky reality we live in. The illusion also is pervading. It's pervasive. It's everywhere, the illusion, the programming. And so sometimes people through free will do end up getting stuck. I like to say we have versions of a blueprint in closing on this question. We have the blueprint that we bring into the life where we've got all the goals, right? Goal, hashtag goals with a Z. And I'm gonna do this and I wanna do that. And I wanna achieve this and I wanna experience that. I wanna suffer here and then I wanna learn from that and then I wanna move on to this and I wanna have a ministry here. Like that's my blueprint. And we build it all in. Some of us get it right the first time. We get into the life and we hit all of the paths, the destinations, the relationships. We get all of the tools and the resources that we need in order to fully occupy our life purpose and what it is we came here to do. Some of us get it right the first time. Most of us don't. Most of us get it partly or mostly right. Like we start off on the path, we're instilled within us is the calling of the life and we all have a calling people we all have a purpose we're all here to do something and within us there is the energetic pattern that is alive that is always talking to us hey you have a calling you have a plan you have a map most of us start off following that and then we detour here and there we detour in relationships like me and that crazy relationship i detoured there for two years I could have been there for three seconds and continued on and achieved things much more quickly. But most of us also sense and feel the calling of the energy within us and we make our way back to the path. 
and we continue on and then we get the resources and we meet the people and then maybe that person also causes us to detour and so on and so forth and so we partly or mostly achieve all the hashtag goals that's most of us and then the final version is the person who has the blueprint and all the plans and who comes into the life with the remembrance of that and feeling the calling but then gets waylaid and never gets out of that misalignment from the blueprint that would be for example my dad my dad my dad y'all was so smart <laughs> talk about smart really smart the capacity on that man plus he was talented he could play music he could do art he was just high level value in terms of being a person like he had the capacity for it all he had a wonderful sense of humor he had such a big brain ball he could have done anything with his life however built into his blueprint was a season of addiction it was meant to be just a season and a season can be a month two months a year three years whatever but there's an, a beginning and an ending but addiction is like so many other things so sticky in this reality it's magnetic it can trap you and I believe my father detoured right he went well he went into the season of addiction as he was supposed to but then detoured and stayed there and he never got out as soon as he began drinking and doing drugs in his 20s he always was drinking and doing drugs and from that space of misalignment and disorientation he acted out in very abusive ways and tra traumatizing ways to my fa my mother and my family my brother and myself and was the abuser the abuser of my life knock on wood <laughs> I don't want another abuser in my life but it's the abuser of my life so some would say that guy wasted his whole life that guy's gonna die life review it see that he totally missed the mark and now he's gonna have to come back and do it all over again no that's karmic wheel misinformation I don't believe in the karmic wheel we are self-determining sovereign consciousnesses we choose the realities in which we would like to have experiences we choose all of that nobody's gonna make me reincarnate okay peace out after this life I need a break so no my dad doesn't have to come back and try it again with kind of the same constructs in place within a map he could if he wanted to but he doesn't need to also my father's life wasn't wasted here I am here I am I've often said that the most powerful light workers the most powerful inspirers the most powerful healers and therapists and motivators are products of abuse and trauma the reason we build in abuse and trauma into the blueprint is because it's the intention of the soul to experience it to know it pain is the greatest teacher they say and I don't know it's the greatest but it's certainly a teacher and so we are taught by the pain we are taught by the abuse we are taught by the inequity of power wielded against us absolutely and it hurts and it's a season and then we move through it we embolden ourselves at some point we are called to embolden ourselves at some point and we get out of the cycle of abuse or we get away from the cycle of abuse and we can see it from a different vantage point and we can learn right we can learn what that means why it happens who's the vulnerable one in that situation why are they vulnerable what can they do to not be vulnerable what could I have done to not be vulnerable all these lessons that come from being abused and and being in the proximity of an abuser they're powerful lessons lessons are energy they're patterns of energy you take the lessons as the abused person as the traumatized person as the pained person and you transmute them you're called to transmute them which means to reform them change them from the negative abuse the darkness and transmute them into the light bring light into it and let that transform you be transformed by the renewing of your mind and by higher understanding of why things happen goosebumps that's what we're called to do the abused to transmute it to leave it to empower ourselves get up off your knees 
You are sovereign. And so empower yourselves. Watch yourself as you are empowered and as you extricate yourself from the situation, as you create your own path and intelligently design your life and return to your blueprint. Perhaps you never left your blueprint. Because what happens when you do that? Well, you know how to do it. When you know how to do that, when you know how to extricate yourself from abuse, when you know how to say, no more, I'm not doing that. I'm sovereign, man. I can live the life that I want to live and I'm going to do that. And I choose the relationships that I want and I choose abundance and I choose wellness. When you learn how to do that, you can help other people to do that as well. That's why my father lived. That's why my father abused. That's why my father had a life that was incredibly powerful because I have a life that is incredibly powerful. And I also have eyes, you see, through the eyes that formerly observed so much pain and violence and the most atrocious things, truly, I don't even wanna tell you what they are. I don't want you to even think about that they're possible. Through the eyes that formerly watched that, I now see the abused, the energy of abuse in the other person. I can see them. If I meet you, I can see it. I feel it. I remember it. It helps me to identify where my ministry is, where my work is. Because I see, I remember, I've been there and I can help you. I can speak to you in a vocabulary that I learned as a result of being abused and being in a season of my life, which I built into my blueprint for this very moment where I can talk to you in a language that you can hear. Powerful. Do you get it? Powerful. So even though my father had a few versions of the blueprint he could have gone with, right? He could have hashtag goals. He could have killed it. He didn't though. He had a different path. It's all good, nothing's wasted, because here we are having this conversation. And I wouldn't be here without Dennis Scott Milligan. You dig? So we have free will before we incarnate and we have free will after we get here as well. We are sovereign individuals. We are the consciousness that stands outside of the reality. We are the gamer. We are the one playing the game. We are the ones switching the game to putting in a new game. We are the ones in power and in control. We always have free will. And some of us use that free will to stay in damaging relationships, such as I did with crazy mind control guy. He wasn't crazy. That was a crazy relationship with that guy. I stayed there too long. I elongated the karma of it all. I elongated the season of it all. But having done that allows me now to recognize that in me, the next time I meet somebody, there's a remembrance, there's a recall, there's an energetic understanding. Aha, that, res that resembles a lesson I've already learned. That resembles a person I've already known. And now I'm equipped to make the right choices for myself. Because I've been there. I've done that. And I learned. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. I hope that helps, Mike Rivera. Thank you for such a cool question. Because I think people wonder. People do wonder. I know they do. And I've gotten people get super pissed at me, for real, for saying, you built it in. Like this one, you built, Crystal, you built your dad in. Like you and your dad, the soul that is your father, the soul in the soul group, you made the agreement before you even got here. You had a contract, contract agreement blueprint. Because it makes people feel like they're responsible for the shit that happened to them in their life. That's, we're, we're not talking 3D people, we're talking soul complex. We're talking soul urge and soul impulse. We're talking about using and utilizing all the energy, all the lesson, everything we can, that's what the soul does, to evolve. The soul uses everything at its disposal to evolve. It transforms it so that it makes its way back to source. That's what we're here to do. It's not that you're responsible for your own pain. It's not that you were asking for it. Of course not, no, but we challenge you to pivot towards what you have learned from it. 
and focus on how it has actually enriched you and equipped you. Now, some of you might not be there yet, and that's okay. It's a process. I had to heal, yo. I had to heal for years. I was pissed off. I was angry. I became an abuser of sorts through my verbal abuse of people. I had to do that. I had to self-correct. So you may be where you are right now, and you might not be able to hear that this is all for your soul's betterment, and that's okay, and that's okay. But I think there are a lot of you out there who are ready to say, I've got it. Thank you. Thank you, God in me. Thank you, soul. Thank you, I am. I receive that. I receive the lessons of that. I'm open for the revealing of more lessons based on what I have encountered. A lot of us are ready for that release. I know that I am, and I'm sure that many of you are as well. Sounds like the trucks are here. And also, my coffee has gotten cold. So on that note, I am going to conclude Conscious Coffee with you. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me this entire time. I encourage you to please subscribe if you haven't yet. And also to give me a like, because that's awesome. And also to share this video if you felt that there was something good in it that somebody else might need to hear. Please share this video. Let's grow our community. And if you're looking for an online spiritual community, don't forget the lab, y'all. All you have to do is go to Facebook and enter into the search bar, The Lightworkers Lab. You'll find us. You can join. I do want to say something here, though, before we close. As we get bigger in the lab, the need for guidelines and the need for rules becomes more important. And I'm kind of a natural rebel. Do you know what I mean? Well, don't, don't tell me what, don't purport to tell me what I need to do with myself. Like that's just in my nature. And I've always been that way. And when the lab first started out, we were quite small and everybody could do whatever we wanted to because we were all on the same page. We were just loving each other, loving each other up and it was cool. But now we're at 4,500 people and now in the lab you've got all kinds of different personalities there. Some are extra dogmatic, some are like, hey, peace and love. Some are coming in to troll, some are coming in to find a way to ask for stuff. or like. So there's all kinds of new things that are happening and because of that, I just want you to know I am very present in the lab and I, and I often get up and I teach in the lab just as I've taught here and I also do readings in the lab, but I have managers for the lab. Like I'm not in charge of who stays and who goes necessarily. Like I am definitely the last word about stuff, but I leave the management of the lab to my moderators and to my specific managers. And so some people have come in and they have been escorted out. <laughs> And then I hear from them on YouTube, like, yo, I joined your awesome spiritual tribe and I was escorted out. But that's because for whatever reason, it wasn't, you weren't adhering to sort of the guidelines that we need to have in order for the lab to be a sacred space of respect, of love, of growth, of enrichment. And so as we continue to grow, that's just kind of what it is, you know? I don't know how, I, I'm there right now, but like, I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. I've got a book coming out on Dominion. You're going to want to buy it. Okay. I've got a retreat coming up. I have events. I have classes. So I have a lot happening. Um, but if, if the Lightworkers Lab feels like a fit for you, and if you really are looking for somewhere where you can go and enrich and learn, you should check out the Lightworkers Lab and see if you like us. You don't have to like us. And if you don't, peace out. You can keep it moving. That's fine. No judgment. But if you do, Want to check us out, go to Facebook, The Lightworkers Lab, and ask to join. Also, if you don't like Facebook, I get it. I totally get it. But you still want to learn more, you can go to thelightworkerslab.com slash free hyphen library right here. Look, it's magic. Oh, my God. Right here. And you'll see, I think, about 27 different spiritual lessons that we have made available, things like classes on crystals, classes on astrological houses, classes on high vibration eating, so much cool info. All of it is free. All you have to do is sign up. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more and you don't want to join the group, that's cool. Go to the free library right here and sign up and you have access to all of that. And on that note, I hope that you know that I got nothing but love for you, baby. My heart light is all red. It's glowing. It's beautiful. I hope that 
wherever you are on the planet today, you are having a beautiful day. Bye, guys.